Hello again, and how are we all? Right, it is that time of year again, my friends, where we delve into the macabre, the creepy, and the scary. For it is Halloween, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. I'm going to be narrating a series of stories, some real-life horror. All of these tales come from the subreddit Let's Not Meet. The events are real. The people who wrote them are real. The horror is real. So, without any further ado, let us begin. Good evening, one and all, to eight tales that happened on Halloween night. But first, a bonus story that also serves as a cautionary tale to both parents and for those of you planning to trick or treat tonight. On Halloween night of 1974, eight-year-old Timothy O'Brien went trick or treating with his sister Elizabeth, his father Ronald, a neighbor, and their two children in Pasadena, Texas. The night started innocently enough for the group, but would end in tragedy. When the group tried at a particular house, only for no one to answer them, they grew impatient and quickly moved on to the next house, but Ronald stayed behind. He soon caught up with them and produced five 21-inch long pixie sticks that he said were given to him by the owner of the previous house, who were just taking their time to answer the door. At the end of the night, he gave two to the neighbor's children, one each to Elizabeth and Timothy, and the last remaining stick to a child he knew from church. It had begun to rain, so the trick-or-treating was cut short, and the group split up and went back to their respective homes. Before bed, Timothy asked his parents if he could eat some of the candy he had collected, and chose to start with the pixie stick. Timothy had been unable to get the powdered candy out of the straw, so his father helped him loosen the powder. After eating the candy, Timothy complained that it had tasted very bitter, so Ronald had given him some Kool-Aid to wash away the taste. Timothy immediately began to complain of stomach pains and ran to the bathroom where he began to vomit and convulse. Ronald held Timothy while he was vomiting, and Timothy went limp in his arms. Timothy had died en route to the hospital less than an hour after eating the pixie stick. A pathology report revealed that the pixie stick had been laced with a large amount of potassium cyanide, enough to kill two adults. They had been opened, laced with the poison, and resealed with a staple. Fear and outcry spread throughout the community in the wake of Timothy's passing, prompting parents to hand every piece of candy onto the police for examination, because they all believed that a deranged maniac had been indiscriminately handing out poison sweets in order to kill as many children as possible on Halloween night. Police became suspicious of Ronald because he and his neighbour had only taken the children to a handful of homes across two streets. Their suspicions increased after learning that none of the homes that the group had visited that night had been handing out pixie sticks. After walking around the neighbourhood with police three times, Ronald led them to the home that the group had visited but whose occupant had not answered the door. He says he had revisited the home before catching up with the group. He later told officers that the owner of the home did not turn off the lights, but had cracked open the door and handed him the five pixie sticks. He claimed to only have seen the man's arm, which he described as hairy. The home in question was owned by a man called Courtney Melvin. Melvin was an air traffic controller, at Hobby Airport, 
and did not return home until 11 p.m. that night. Police ruled out Melvin as a suspect, when nearly 200 people had confirmed that Melvin had in fact been at work at the time. The truth eventually came out. Ronald himself had poisoned the candy. His motive? To collect on the life insurance policies he had taken out on both of his children, to settle his outstanding debts that had exceeded over a hundred thousand dollars. Aside from the two he had given to his own children, Ronald had given the other three out in an effort to cover his tracks, playing on the urban legend that a mad prisoner who handed out Halloween candy laced with poison, needles, or candied apples with razor blades in them. It was also uncovered that in the months preceding Timothy's passing, Ronald had been visiting a chemical supply store in Houston to buy the cyanide, shortly after asking how much would be a fatal dosage. It should also be noted that he left without purchasing anything, after learning the smallest amount available to buy was five pounds. Ronald's friends and co-workers later testified that in the preceding months he had shown an unusual interest in the poison. Throughout the trial that followed, Ronald maintained his innocence, but the evidence against him was too substantial for the judge and the jury to ignore. Ronald was charged with one count of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder and was sentenced to death by lethal injection. During his time in prison, Ronald was shunned and despised by his inmates on death row for killing his son and was absolutely friendless. The inmates had even petitioned to hold an organized demonstration on his execution date to fully express their hatred of him. On March 31st, 1984, shortly after midnight, Ronald O'Brien was executed in the Huntsville unit. In his final statement, Ronald maintained his innocence, stating he felt the death penalty was wrong, and he added, and quote, I forgive all, and I do mean all, those who have been involved in my death. God bless you all, and may God's best blessings always be yours. During the execution, a crowd of about 300 demonstrators gathered outside the prison cheered, while some yelled, trick or treat. Ronald O'Brien became known later as the man who killed Halloween for his crimes, and has also been dubbed the Candyman. Take the message away from this tragic event, and check your sweets that you get tonight for any signs of alteration. It might just save your life tonight. And now, on to the eight stories. Our first offering tonight comes to us from user Daily Donuts 16 with a story titled, Be Careful Who You Open Your Door To. On Halloween. This incident happened to me last year on Halloween. My little brother and I were home alone, since our parents had gone out to a Halloween party. They had tasked us with handing out candy to the trick-or-treaters. This bummed my brother and I out, because we had made plans to go trick-or-treating with a few friends. Our parents told us that we were too old to still be trick-or-treating, and that we could instead invite our friends over to the house and hang out there. My friends declined my invitation to come over, because they still wanted to go out trick-or-treating. So, that left me home alone with my brother, handing out the candy. A lot of people stopped by our house, and by ten o'clock almost all the candy was gone. My brother and I decided that we'd eat the rest. We were sitting on the couch watching a scary movie, stuffing ourselves with candy, when there was a knock at the door. 
I stormed off the couch, wondering who the hell it could be, knocking at our door this late. I assumed that it was just some late-night trick-or-treaters. Even if that was the case, I had turned the porch light and Halloween decorations off, which would have been a dead giveaway that we were out of candy or that we weren't home. So I assumed it was my parents. Being cautious, I looked through the peephole and saw a suspicious man standing on our front porch. He was wearing a black hoodie with the hood over his head, which made it difficult to see his face. The only detail of his face I could spot was that he had a beard and dry, crusty lips. There was no way this guy was a trick-or-treater, because he wasn't wearing a costume, and was far too old to be trick-or-treating alone. His hands were stuffed in the front pocket of his hoodie, and he also looked very thin. Every single red flag went off in my head about this guy. There was just no way in hell I was going to open the door. Still looking through the peephole, I watched as he knocked on the door again. He seemed desperate for us to open the door, and was shaking a bit. It wasn't cold outside, definitely not cold enough for someone to be trembling. He was giving me a bad vibe, and I wanted to get rid of him as soon as possible. We're out of candy, I shouted to him. I watched as a smile spread across his face. It wasn't a friendly smile either. Are you alone in there? the man asked, in almost a mocking voice. His voice was raspy and dry. Should I call the police? My little brother asked me quietly, gripping his cell phone. The man let out a low grumble and said, Sounds like you're not alone in there. I continued to watch him through the peephole. His hands were tightly wedged in his pocket, and he was still shaking a bit. I began to wonder if he was armed. I decided to take action and spoke to him in the most intimidating voice I could. Get the fuck away from my house or I'll call the police, I shouted. His smile faded, and he bared his teeth. His teeth were piss yellow, and I concluded that he was probably some homeless crackhead. He had a look of fury plastered on his face. Fortunately, he left without trying to break in, probably because he knew I wasn't fucking around with him. I didn't stop watching him through the peephole until I saw him completely off our property. My brother and I breathed a sigh of relief and decided not to call the police. My brother and I were a bit paranoid after this and watched TV until our parents came home. We didn't tell them about the man, since he hadn't really tried to harm us. Now that I think back to this, I wish we had called the police, because maybe we would have been able to prevent a murder. You see, the very next day we found out that the elderly woman, who lived a few houses down from us, had been brutally murdered. Her neighbour had found her lying on her front porch, covered in blood. She had been stabbed multiple times in the chest and neck. My brother and I immediately knew who had done it and we told the police what we knew. They couldn't do much from the information we had given them, since we hadn't seen many details of his face. They went on the hunt for the man, but never caught him. I blame myself for that old lady's murder, because I could have prevented it from happening just by calling the police. I think the most disturbing thing of all is the fact he didn't take anything from the old lady's house. Her house had been left untouched, but he could have gone in and taken what he wanted, since her door was wide open. This means he just wanted to kill. It was his only intention. He didn't want money or jewellery. He just had the urge to murder. So to the creepy crackhead Halloween slasher, 
let's not meet. Our next story tonight comes to us from user Darth Max 66 and is called Halloween Encounter. With the recent Mortal Kombat X DLC, including Jason Voorhees, it got me thinking recently about this one encounter I had with someone on Halloween when I was 14 years old. I was around that time in my life where most kids my age would stop trick-or-treating, either because they thought it was lame or because their parents told them to stop. Me and my father had a similar conversation, and in the end, we decided this trick-or-treat would be my final one. So, when October 31st came, my dad helped me paint my face to look like a zombie. I figured that this costume would be simple, yet something I liked. So, zombie it was. I grabbed an empty pillowcase and headed out, with my parents telling me to be back by 11-ish. Before you ask, yes, I was going trick-or-treating by myself. I was able to convince my parents that I needed to get as much candy as I could, and seeing as how I wouldn't be able to do this again next year. So off I went, running from house to house, shoving candy into my pillowcase as fast as I could. So... By the time it got dark, my pillowcase was three quarters full, and I had no intention of slowing down. As I'm about to walk into a new neighborhood, a black van pulls up to the curb that was about a few feet away from me. The door opens, and out of the darkness comes some guy in a hockey mask, tattered jacket, wielding a machete. He turns his head towards me, probably just trying to creep me out. Nice Jason costume, I say, trying to be friendly, as I begin to walk past him. Thanks, zombie. You want some candy? I've got bags of them, he says, as he pulls out these little white sacks of candy. So I, being the idiot 14-year-old I was, opened my pillowcase and let him plop two or three sacks into it. Make sure you eat them real soon, you'll love them, he snickered, which sent a chill down my spine. He left as quickly as he had came, but I shrugged it off as I needed to finish trick-or-treating. I continued down the road, again going from house to house for candy. After the third or fourth house, I noticed something odd. It was the same black van from before. After every house I went to, the van would get closer and closer. At about what I could only guess was 10.30, I headed home, with my sack full to bursting. As I walked... The area behind me illuminated. I turned around, expecting to see a car that would soon pass me. It wasn't. It was the van, and in the driver's seat was the same Jason Voorhees that had given me the candy. My heart stopped, so I broke into a mad dash back to my house, the van easily keeping up with me. I was luckily able to lose him, by running into the woods near my house. I exited the woods that led to my side of the house and looked for the fake rock that held the spare key to our house. After I got in, I put my candy on the kitchen table and somehow found a way to go to sleep. The next morning when I woke up, my parents were sitting at the kitchen table, digging through the bags of candy that Jason had gave me. They started asking me where or who I got the bags from, which started to freak me out. I would later learn that the bags of candy were nothing more than bags of prescription drugs. There was a ton of sleeping pills in them, and I finally understood his intentions. He was going to follow me until I fell asleep, 
and then do God knows what with me after he got me into the van. Now that I think about it, I'm not sure whether or not that machete he had was fake or not. The police came up empty-handed, so I guess I'll never know his fate. If you're reading this, Jason, let's not meet again. Our third terrible tale tonight is brought to us by Hannah Robinson and is titled Creepy Halloween Stalker. Halloween has, unfortunately, never been a big deal out here in Scotland, and that's always bummed me out because I love Halloween. But after this year, I think I'll be happy never celebrating it again. My street and the next street over have a lot of young kids that go out trick-or-treating while I was out shopping all day with my mom. We decided to pick up some sweets in case anyone came to our door. I had plans to go to the cinema to see Oja with my boyfriend, so when I got home, I was getting myself ready to go out, and my mum was busy putting the shopping away. So when the first load of kids came to our door, I was the one who had to answer it. There were children from our street, the next one over, and some I couldn't recognise, as well as an adult at the end of the path. I guessed either a father or older brother by their size, and they were all dressed in black and had some sort of mask covering their face. But it wasn't anything I recognised from a movie or anything. Anyway, they all told me their jokes and I gave them their treats, and they made their way back down the path and onto the next house. I was about to close the door when I noticed that the guy with the kids was still standing at the end of my path. He hadn't noticed, and he wasn't watching the children either. He was looking right at me, and my skin started to crawl when I realized that he was just staring at me. I backed slowly into the house and watched him as he raised his hand and waved very slowly at me. And I was about to call out to him when my mum came to the door to make sure I was all right, and he took off in the opposite way from the children. He hadn't been with them at all, and he left as soon as he realised I wasn't home alone. I was completely freaked out and told my boyfriend all about it when he came to the house to pick me up, but I quickly forgot all about it when we were watching the movie. When I finally got home, it was getting really late, and trick-or-treating was well and truly over around here. When I got inside, my mum was get just getting ready to take the dogs out for a walk so they could do their last-minute business, and they would meet my dad on his way home from work. So I was going to be home alone. After my last horrible encounter, posted on here, I don't really like being home alone, but it's worse on Halloween, and it always has been. Anyway, I was home alone, and I grabbed some snacks and went up to my bedroom, and onto my computer so I could do some of my writing, scroll through Tumblr, and listen to music. After my first creepy encounter with the guys coming into my house and into my backyard, my dad bought a motion-sensored light and attached it to the wall of our house right beside my window. Normally, it would go off whenever a cat would walk along our fence, but it would usually go off after a couple of minutes. I always know when the light has come on, because it lights up my whole bedroom, given where it is placed, and while I was sitting at my computer, the light came on. I ignored it at first, because I knew it would go off soon, but five minutes passed, and it still hadn't gone off. So I opened my blinds to have a look outside and see what was going on. My stomach almost fell out of my ass when I looked around and saw the creep from hours before, sitting on the fence, waving at my window to keep the light on. His waving slowed down suddenly when he spotted me, and it was all seriously creepy again. 
and I didn't know what to do. I just got flashbacks from before. Luckily, I heard the front door open and my parents coming into the house with the dogs, so I rushed down the stairs and started screaming at them about the guy on the fence. My dad didn't question me. He just took the dogs and rushed through the house, threw the back door open and ran outside. When... And then I heard him shouting, Get the fuck out of here, you creep! I'm going to phone the police! My dad scared him off, but I convinced him not to call the police, because I didn't want to relive the whole thing again. I just wanted to go to sleep and forget about the whole night. So, to the creepy guy in the mask waving at me from the end of my path and sitting on my fence, let's not meet. Our next story comes to us from Lyra Knight, and is called Tall, Dark and Creepy. Oddly enough, it happened near Halloween. This took place in fall of 2008 at the college I used to go to. It was Halloween week, and my friends and I decided to dress up and have a little party with cupcakes and punch on campus. We were all laughing and taking pictures, and I turn around, and there was this guy that just showed out of nowhere. I said hi, and we made small chit-chat. He turns out to be an okay guy, and a few of my friends said he was single, and that I should see where it goes. He was tall, 6'2", broad, black hair, and charming. We had a lot in common, so we decided to go to the movies together, but we had to make a stop at his place to pick up some money. We get to his place and end up drinking, listening to music, and before I knew it, we were having sex. He was attentive, and the sex was rough, and well, it was great. I don't normally sleep well at night, so while he slept, I decided to go on his laptop and check my mail and watch YouTube videos. Not long I was on his laptop when I hear this tingling from his window. I couldn't see who it was considering the blinds and it being pitch black in his room. I go over to Gerard whispering to tell him there was someone at his window calling his name. He whispers back saying he knows and told me to put the laptop away slowly and lay down until she goes. She kept trying to get into his apartment, but the door was locked. She kept banging on the door, saying, Where is Gerard? Eventually, she gave up and went away. The next day, I asked him who it was, and he said his girlfriend. I got my stuff and left. He kept saying he would leave her for me, but I didn't want to be with someone like that. So I thought it was over, but he kept calling me saying he loved me, and that he needs me to live. He kept showing up to my classes. I eventually told my guy friends to tell him to leave me alone. He did, and I thought it was the last I had heard from him. He was still friends with some of my friends, which didn't bother me, as long as he ignores me. Two of my friends came... Two of my friends went over to his apartment because he kept leaving suicidal messages on their phones. They came to a trashed apartment with broken bottles in the bathroom and blood on the walls with my name saying, I love you, written all over the bedroom. My friends called to tell me this and also told me to please carry protection with me at all times. He tried to come back twice. One incident, he yelled from a bus from the college, waiting to leave, that I better not block him on Facebook, or else. I found his profile and blocked him immediately. The last time I saw him, he snuck up behind me while I was waiting for the bus downtown, and I ran from the bus stop back to near the coffee shop. That is one creep I never want to see again. Our next tale is from Socially Inept 101, and is called Almost Taken. It was around Halloween a couple of years back, and some friends and I were watching a TV show about the scariest movie moments. 
When the show ended, we decided to share true scary stories we had. This story my friends shared still creeps me out. When my friend's dad was younger, his family were really poor, and a lot of times he would have to go dumpster diving to try and find food to eat. Well, one time he was in a pretty affluent neighborhood, when he opened a trash can to find a bunch of mutilated dogs and cats inside. This really freaked him out, he was really young. Plus, I think it would freak anyone out, so naturally he ran away. Well, a couple of weeks later, he went back to that neighborhood, and was walking around when he saw a man standing outside his garage. The man saw him, and pushed his automatic garage door opener, while telling him he had a shiny new bike in the garage just for him. Side note, this was back when automatic garage door openers were only starting to catch on, and were fairly a new thing. My friend's dad started walking towards the door, but then remembered the mutilated animals he had seen weeks earlier, got scared, and ended up running away. After my friend told me this story, she said the guy turned out to be this huge serial killer. She couldn't remember his name, so she called her dad. It turned out to be this man. John Wayne Gacy Our next story is brought to us by Sarah Diedrich, and is titled, You're Next. I want to apologize in advance. I am not the best storyteller and this happened a few years ago. I tried my best to forget about it, so some parts are a bit hazy. I also want to apologize for the length of this post. I tried to condense it as much as I could. I probably could have been much more descriptive. Definitely read way scarier stories on here than this, but here's mine anyway. In 2012, I was living in Florida with two friends, a couple. Our bedrooms were right next to each other. We lived on the second floor of a duplex. Our neighborhood would definitely not be considered a nice part of town, but not the worst either. The couple that lived downstairs seemed nice enough. I would guess they were in their mid to late forties, and we'd had a few minor issues with them. We shared laundry facilities with them, and sometimes our clothes would be moved, or they would be very loud on weeknights, but nothing too serious. I will say, however, these people were definitely not favourites of ours. For the first three months or so we were in the apartment, things were relatively normal. Then things got weird. For the past week or so leading up to these events, our neighbours had a lady friend staying over, and we'd see the three of them outside late at night drinking. She seemed sort of sketchy though. When we'd greet them on our way indoors, she'd never say a word, and to be honest, she looked like she was on drugs every time we'd seen her. We only ever saw her at night, in the dark. One night, while my roommates were sleeping, I was up late planning an extremely last-minute Halloween costume. I was planning on going out with a girlfriend the next night. As I say, this wasn't the nicest neighborhood, and throughout the night, I would hear random shouting, mostly in Spanish. I wasn't too concerned about this, but I definitely stayed more alert after hearing these voices so close to our home. At around 4 a.m., I heard a loud banging on our front door. There were two entrances to our apartment. One, the front with external steps. The second, out back, with steps leading up inside the building. Since we didn't really know many people in the area, and it was so late, I was really freaked out. The knocking went on for about 60 seconds before I decided to call my roommate in the next room on his cell phone. I asked him if he heard the knocking. In a sleepy haze, he said, Yes, who is that? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to call the cops. The banging persisted, and I dialed 911. I spoke with the dispatcher and began to explain my situation. 
just as I had let him know there was someone outside, I heard my front door swing open. At this point, both of my roommates were awake, and I opened my bedroom door to find a woman standing in our hallway talking to them. For a second, I thought maybe my roommates knew this girl. One of their cousins lived not too far away, and I'd never met her, so that could have been the case. But the conversation that transpired between them changed my mind. She spoke very calmly at first. We only made out bits and pieces what she had said. There was mention of my roommates fucking with her, and a need to take her medicine. She also said something about the boys sprinkling dust on her, and that if we didn't leave her alone, she was going to kill them. We had absolutely no idea what was going on, or what she was talking about. We didn't even know who this woman was. There was no lights on in our hallway, so we had trouble making anything out but shadows, and I glanced at her waist. From the light in my room, I could see she was wearing a utility belt and carrying a large kitchen knife and flashlight. Although I'd always considered myself a tough girl, my heart was racing as I cried on the phone with dispatch. She has a knife! My roommates hadn't taken notice of this, but heard me and slammed their bedroom door shut. I did the same. The woman yelled at us through our bedroom doors. After she heard I'd seen the knife, she said, Don't worry, honey. I'm not here for you. I'm going to take care of these two. My roommate yelled to her, The cops are on their way! And I stayed on the phone with the 911 operator for the next 20 minutes until he told me the police were outside. The police kicked our back door down and came inside. The woman was gone. They searched for a way she could have entered our apartment. Our front and back doors were both locked, and checked to see if anything had been stolen. No one could figure out how she got in, and all of our belongings were there. They found saliva on our front door, but no fingerprints. A few days later, a detective came to our house so that we could participate in a photo lineup. None of us could identify the woman that was in our house, but we were able to describe her the best we could. The detective let us know that she would be watching the house, and we felt a little safer. Meanwhile, the door that the cops had kicked in to gain entry was still not repaired. Thanks, shitty landlord. So we were unable to lock it, and felt pretty vulnerable to another break-in. Although I wasn't entirely sure, my roommates were confident that this woman who broke in was the same woman that had been staying with our neighbours. At this point we felt like they could not be trusted, and the room where we shared laundry facilities was a big issue for us. There was a lock separating our apartment from it, but it was nothing that couldn't be broken with a good push. A few times, the man who lived downstairs came up and told us that he knew his friend wasn't the culprit. He wouldn't share any information with the police about her, and we felt like he was hiding something. Alas, there was nothing we could do that we hadn't already done. After meeting with the detective, my roommates left for work, and I was in the house with a friend. There was a knock at the door. At this point, I wasn't feeling very trusting of anyone, even in the daylight, but I still cautiously opened the door. And there she stood, acting as if nothing was wrong. She told me she had heard that her evil twin was at our house recently. She apologized and continued to babble a bunch of nonsense that I was finding difficult to remember at this point. I dialed the police right in front of her and then shut the door in her face. The cops came and got her away from my front door, but didn't arrest her. They spoke with her outside while another officer came in to get a statement from me. I let him know that this was the same woman who had broken in earlier in the week, but he told me. We know her pretty well, she's harmless. My roommates were right. This was the woman from downstairs. Feeling helpless, I figured the police knew what they were doing and decided to let it go. The next morning I woke up and went outside to check the mail. My car was completely vandalized, 
sand thrown all over it, broken glass, and written in wax on the hood. You're next, and pentagrams. We called the cops immediately, but, as it turns out, the detective who helped us with the photo lineup earlier was on her way to our house, and showed up before any officers did. CSI came, dusted my car for fingerprints. More statements were taken. We were feeling incredibly unsafe. We knew the police were working for us, but our back door was still broken, and nothing was happening fast enough. Luckily, later that night, they caught the woman a few blocks from our house, still carrying the knife. She seemed to be headed back our way. Within a few days, we were advised that the woman had murdered her live-in boyfriend three days before, breaking into our house. Information that the police before claimed that she was harmless and refused to arrest her in front of my house. After a little digging, I also found out that a year prior, the woman who lived downstairs from us also murdered her live-in boyfriend and had sought this crazy lady's advice. Still no idea how she got into our apartment or why she targeted us. As far as I know, the woman is being held somewhere, although I'm not sure what kind of facility she's at. I hope she was placed somewhere where she can overcome her issues with her mental health but I haven't had any updates from the state attorney, other than that letters letting me know about status checks for her. Our next story tonight comes to us from Shizzle91 and is called Serial Killer in the Making. I used to work in a sex shop. I know how it sounds, and while, yes, we sold porn, novelty toys and what not, we primarily sold lingerie, and the store was obviously geared towards women. It is important to note that at this particular location, only one person was working at any given time, as in, on a dead night, I was the only living soul in the building. I know now how stupid and dangerous it was to accept a job where there isn't even a co-worker, let alone a manager with you at all times, given we were all young females and closed at midnight. Even though we weren't supposed to carry any type of weapon, I always had a pocket knife. Brilliant, right? I was too young to carry a gun, but there was a guy that worked next door that was super nice and always came to help if we needed him. Customers getting rowdy, call him, and boom, he'd come running. He lived about a block away from the store, so I always felt better about that. That said, we would have creepers come in all the time. I kind of expected that when I got the job. Nobody seemed dangerous, however, just people constantly asking awkward questions. Again, I kind of expect that. However, a month after I started working there, we started getting these weird phone calls every couple of weeks. A guy would call, say he'd lost some sort of a bet, and had to say something humiliating. Sometimes we'd leave him there, etc, etc. We assumed it was a prank caller and let it go at that. However, after a certain amount of times, we began to notice he was only calling on my shift, and if anyone else answered, he would say he'd have the wrong number and hang up. We all knew it was him, and he had a pretty distinct voice. The calls gradually became more and more frequent, and he would ask more and more unusual things. He would ask me to describe certain lingerie, down to the type of stitching it had and everything. I started getting frustrated, obviously, and would start snapping at him, telling him it's the third time he'd called that week, go somewhere else, or whatever I felt like saying at the time. Where I worked, even if we knew it was a prank call, we were supposed to try and be the wonderful, happy retail customer service providers that would make our bosses proud. So I would start the calls trying to be hopeful, knowing damn good and well where it would end up. Anyway, one night he asked if we had a particular type of corset, which we did, and he said he'd be by that night to look at it. I got creeped out and asked the guy that worked next door to come sit with me until closing, which he did. 
When I brought this up to my manager, she brushed it off. I asked if I could start working with a co-worker, but no. It wasn't in the budget. Yeah, okay. Moving on, the calls stopped. For about a week, if I'm lucky. He began calling again, saying he was going to come by sometime that night, yada yada yada. I started brushing them off, as more of his prank calls, until one night we were dead. I was in the store by myself, and a guy walked in, and he said he had a strange question. My heart sank. Soon as I heard him talking, I immediately sat down behind the counter and refused to stand up and come out onto the floor. He said he'd lost a bet, and he had to parade around downtown dressed as a woman. Do you sell fake breasts? Great. I told him no, as if it were closer to Halloween he would go to a costume store, where he'd most likely find foam breasts there, but the closest thing we could suggest was to buy a bra and stuff it. Then he asked, as serious as can be, if I knew where he could buy breast tissue. You know, like women lose to mastectomies? In my head, I was thinking, what a fucking morgue? But told him there was more than I could help him with. He looked around the store for a minute and left. Once again, I called the guy from next door and he came and sat with me. The next time I worked, I sat by the panic button. Any time I wasn't helping a customer, why didn't I walk out and say if they didn't pay me enough for this once, he'd start going Ed Gein on me? I'll never know. Sure enough, he came back in once when I was by myself. I heard the door open, and he comes up running to the counter, and asked if we sold honeymoon kits. I pointed to the corner of the store where they would be and sat back down. He slowly circled the room, pretending to look at the merchandise. I was watching him on the security cameras, and noticed every time he would walk past one of our storage doors, he would lean in and listen. Holy shit, he's making sure I'm really alone in here. When he got back round to the counter, he reached in his pocket and pulled out his cell phone, and pretended to start talking to somebody, and ran back out the door. Now, he was close enough to the counter that I could hear everything that the phone never rang, and it didn't even vibrate. Once I knew he was out of the store, I went to the front window to try and get a license plate number, because now I know this guy was whacked. He was already gone. It was hard to explain the layout of the store, but let's just say for him to be gone by that time, I got to the window. He would have had to have had his car running and waiting for him to come back out. However, I was able to see that it was a white SUV with round tail lights. That's it. Figuring this had gone beyond asking a friend for help, I called the local de police department, who said they would send an officer out to stay in the parking lot until I closed up. As it turns out, the officer came out early to ask about the situation, and that he would be back at midnight. Between the phone call with the station and the time the officer came to the store, I noticed a white SUV crawl through the parking lot right next against the building. The officer came and went, and by the time he came back that night, the same SUV came through the parking lot four more times. However, since I couldn't see the guy's face for sure, I didn't call the police back. At the time, I thought it was a huge no-no making calls when you're not sure, and although later they assured me given the situation I should have called. Sounds stupid now. Anyway, after that night, I turned in my two weeks notice and got a job elsewhere. Everything was fine for several weeks, actually a few months, until one night I was in the car getting ready to go to dinner with my husband, when I got a phone call on my cell. I didn't recognize the number, but I had recently got a new phone and wasn't sure if it was a deleted contact, so I answered and sure enough, it was him. Side note, I'm part of a website that offers spiritual counselling and whatnot. Don't ask, just go with it. He said he got my number from the website and wanted to know if I gave gender role counselling. I said I hadn't before, but I'd give it a try, and gave him the work email associated with the site, hoping he'd email me and I'd have more evidence to turn into the police. 
First of all, the site never had my phone number. Second of all, since I don't know where he got my number, I don't know if he knew my address, where I went to school, etc. Third of all, I'm now convinced this guy wanted to go Buffalo Bill and wanted to wear my skin. So finally, I go to the police department, file a report, and give them the number. No clue what they did with it, but the calls stopped and I never saw the guy again. It's been a little over a year now, and I don't even live in the same state anymore, thankfully. Our final story of the evening comes to us from Tasha Lou 96 and is called Alone on Halloween. This happened back in 2014. I went out on a night out for Halloween during my first year of university. I was wearing high-heeled boots and a leather jacket. Over the course of the night, drunk me had taken them off and left them at our group's table. Due to feeling uncomfortable, by the end of the night, I had practically danced my way to near sobriety and went to my group's table. However, they had given up the table, and my boots and jacket were nowhere to be seen. Someone had stolen them. However, they weren't expensive, and I rarely wore them anyway. Now, however, I had to walk the 15 minutes back to my accommodation. I didn't have money for a taxi, so I thought I'd just walk slowly. I asked one guy, the asshole in the group that everyone hated, if he could just keep me company because he was tall. He laughed and said no and walked off, dragging the only girl who was also shoeless with him. So here I was, walking alone, shoeless, in a busy city centre, watching out for broken glass or anything that was harmful or disgusting. Everyone else was so far ahead I couldn't even see them, but I kept going. I was halfway to my place when I was stopped by a Middle Eastern man. The city was very culturally diverse. He asked if I was okay, and I was grateful someone cared enough to make sure that I was alright. He offered to help me walk back home, so I accepted for at least part of the way. He was very kind and told me his name was Omar. He started saying how beautiful he thought I was, and how lucky he was to have found me, which unsettled me slightly. Once I was round the corner from my place, I thanked Omar and said I'd walk the rest of the way on my own. He instantly looked offended. Why don't you want to invite me in for a cup of tea to thank me? I told him no, because I didn't know him. He kept a hold of my wrist. Well, can I have a kiss for helping you? Again, I declined, and his grip tightened. Well, do I get a hug for being your friend? At this point, I just wanted him to let go, so I gingerly gave him a hug. He then grabbed me and tried to kiss me, but I pressed my lips together, and instead he just licked my face. I finally get free and start walking away. He follows me. I sped up, and so does he. I abandon my check for glass on the floor and begin sprinting, now terrified as I hear him running too. I get up my phone and call my friend Rob, who I beg to help me. Omar is no longer following me, but I needed someone to keep me safe. He agrees and gets to my flat not long after I do with a knife, in case Omar was still there. I told the people in my group, and they were mortified that they had left me alone. I returned home for a week because I was thoroughly shook up. Now, on a night out, I make sure everyone is close so it doesn't happen again, to me or to anyone else. So, Omar, let's not meet. Hi again. I hope you enjoyed this video and listening to the stories in which it contains. I just want to thank you very much for watching, and to all of you, have a very happy Halloween. Until next time, I will see you again, my friend.